Mr. Chief Justice, President Johnson, Vice President Humphrey, my fellow Americans, and my fellow citizens of the world, I ask that you share with me today the majesty of this moment. It is in the orderly transfer of power that we celebrate the unity that keeps us free. Every moment of history is a fleeting time, precious and unique, but some stand out as moments of beginning when courses can be set that shape decades and centuries. This can be such a moment. The greatest honor that history can bestow is that of peacemaker, and that honor now beckons America a chance to help lead the world at last out of the valley of turmoil and onto the high ground of peace that man has dreamed of since the dawn of civilization. If we succeed, future generations will say of us that we mastered our moment and we made the world safe for mankind. This is our summons to greatness. And I believe that the American people are ready to answer that call. Richard Milhouse Nixon became the 37th president of the United States today with a solemn commitment to devote all of his energies to the cause of peace among nations and the healing of the strident divisions among the American people. Jury anti-war demonstrators tried to stone Nixon's car during his inaugural parade Monday after club swinging police beat back an attempt to overrun their lines. Nixon's lim limousine sped up abruptly as two large rocks and pieces of garbage rained down within a few feet of him. Anti-war demonstrators by about a thousand came to a climax at the first mass Inauguration Day demonstrations in our nation's history. Stepped up communist attacks and other terrorism incidents coinciding with the inauguration of President Nixon were reported Tuesday throughout South Vietnam. The incidents included daylight mortar launches 11 miles outside of Saigon and two terrorism incidents within the city. Broadcasters from the Viet Cong called for stepped up efforts to drive out the Americans and to overthrow the Saigon government. U.S. headquarters said that 190 Americans were killed and that 1,244 troops were wounded. The toll sent the number of U.S. troops in the last eight years of fighting the war in Vietnam to 31,181. The report placed South Vietnamese losses last week at 264 killed, 951 wounded, and 60 missing. Communist losses 2,350 killed. North Vietnamese and Viet Cong casualties since January 1, 1961, 438,937. We interrupt our regularly scheduled programming for a special address from the President of the United States, Richard M. Nixon. Good evening, my fellow Americans. I have asked for this television time tonight to report to you on a most difficult and urgent problem, the war in Vietnam. In the four months it's taking office, there is nothing that has taken so much of my time and energy as the search for lasting peace in Vietnam. I know that some believe that I should have ended the war immediately after the inauguration by simply ordering our troops home. That would have been an easy plan. That might have been a most popular plan. But I would have betrayed my solemn duty as President of the United States if I had done so. For four years, American boys have been fighting and dying in Vietnam. For 12 months, our negotiators have been talking to the other side in Paris. And still, the fighting goes on. 
the destruction continues. Brave men still die. New initiatives are necessary. The old formulas and the tired rhetoric are not enough. When Americans are risking their lives in war, it is the responsibility of their leaders to take some risks for peace. I'm reporting from Chicago's South Side, where yesterday a group of anti-war protesters broke into the Selective Service Office on West 63rd Street and destroyed draft files. Joining me now is Colonel John Siegel, Assistant Chief of the Illinois Selective Service Field Division. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Uh, Colonel Siegel, first, do you know how they accessed the building? Did they break through a window, or what exactly happened? Well, apparently one of the men who was arrested had rented office space in our building for the express purpose of gaining access. So this wasn't spur of the moment. This was planned out? I, I don't want to speak out of turn, but it certainly seems that way. The man had taken office space on our floor. So they gained access to your office, and then what? Take us through what happened next. Well, first, they made a mess is what they did. They broke in and they splashed tar and paint all over everything, mostly on records. Those would be draft records? Yes, that's right. And then they hauled quite a bit of it. Again, I'm, I'm talking about records. They hauled quite a bit outside, as, as much as they could carry from the looks of it, and they started a big bonfire. Now, the fire department came and put it out, but a lot of our records were destroyed. How big a blow is that? Do you have backups? Oh, yeah, we, we have duplicates. So to be clear, this will not stop a, stop a single person from getting called up. All it really did was create a lot more work for my staff, and then our office is just a mess. Thank you, Colonel Siegel, and best of luck with the cleanup. Authorities tell us that 18 individuals were arrested in connection with this event, including two or possibly three Catholic priests. A statement was released, signed by 15 of those arrested, stating that the burning of draft records was, quote, an act of creative destruction by white citizens who confront the twin evils of American militarism and racism. Of course, this draft board office covers a largely African American population on the city's south side. This is only the latest raid of a selective service office by anti-war protesters in recent memory. Last year, arrests were made in similar events in Milwaukee and just outside Baltimore. Roman Catholic priests were also arrested in both those cases. Back to you. Six months ago, Richard Nixon served upon himself a summons to greatness. The greatest honor history can bestow, he said, is the title of peacemaker. He is little closer to earning that title today than he was six months ago, and some of his options are running out. Mr. Cormar. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, how do you feel about the various proposals proposing an arbitrary cutoff point to our military involvement in Vietnam? I've considered a number of those proposals, and I realize that they are uh, presented in, with a in good faith and for the best intentions. However, it is my conclusion that if we were to adopt a specific cutoff date, then that inevitably um, continues and perpetuates the war until that date and destroys the possibility of ending the war earlier. I think it's a defeatist attitude. That, that is, defeatist in what it would accomplish, and I do not think it's in the best interest of the United States. And I further believe that these proposals undercut and destroy our negotiating power in Paris. Therefore, I will continue to oppose that kind of arbitrary action. Mr. President, that's Horner, sir. Ah, close enough. <laughs> Mr. President, sir, what's your view of the student and campus protests being planned for this fall against the Vietnam War? Well, I've often said that there's little that we here in Washington can do 
regarding the running of university and college campuses across the country. We have enough work to do trying to run the nation. But I am aware that there has been and continues to be opposition to the war on campuses and in the nation. Now, we recognize with respect to these kinds of activities, we expect them. But I want to make clear that under no circumstances will I be affected by them whatsoever. Mr. Uh, President, oh, Mr. Oh, Mr. President, how are you doing, sir, in your efforts to end the war in Vietnam? Uh, not as well as I would hope. And I won't be doing as well as I would hope until this war has ended. I can, however, point to some progress. Um, first of all, I point to the fact that we've announced that 60,000 Americans will be returning from Vietnam, and 50,000 who might have been subject to the draft between now and the end of the year will not be drafted. And our um, casualty rate is now down a third from what it was for the same nine-month period last year. On the negotiating front, the United States has made a far-reaching, comprehensive peace proposal and to the other side. Now, there is one thing, however, that we will not negotiate. We will talk about everything else. What we won't negotiate is the right of the people of South Vietnam to pick their own leaders without imposition from us or anyone else. Once the enemy realizes that and realizes they're not going to accomplish their goal by simply waiting us out, negotiations will start and we will end this war hopefully before the end of 1970. That's our hope and our expectation. You and back there. Uh, Jones, Minneapolis Tribune. Uh, my question concerns the draft, sir. The National Council to repeal the draft claims that your draft cuts are a fraud because the summer calls were inflated to allow for proposed cuts. Could you comment, sir? I do not believe that that charge is one of merit. I know of no increase or inflation of the summer draft calls. The reason the current draft calls are lower because it's obvious we need less troops. That's why we did it, not for the reason that's suggested here. Vandals broke into the Indianapolis office of the Selective Service Systems in Indianapolis earlier today, destroying records and spray painting walls and files. FBI said there was a typed note taped to the door of the office by a group who disagreed with the policies of the war in Vietnam. Signed, Beaver 55. This group felt confident that the public would support their values. Former Attorney General Ramsey Clark urged Congress today to find some way other than prison to punish those who oppose the draft. War is bad enough, Clark said, without having to punish those who refuse to serve. It was in his testimony today before a Senate hearing on the administration of the Selective Service System. Four offices housing the files of six Selective Service offices were broken into yesterday morning and extensively damaged. Paint and ink were dumped over the files of Local Board 31 and black ink dumped on the files of the Dorchester Board. File cabinets were systematically ransacked and their contents scattered across the floor of all the Boston offices. A group calling itself the Boston Eight claimed credit for the incident in a release given to news media about noon. needed down here this afternoon. Yeah. I don't know why yeah. 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 it's Saturday, but... Sir, we are the Boston Eight. Yeah. Yeah. We have exhausted...
exhausted all legitimate means of protest. Right. We're now rationing our bodies in hope that you will listen to us, as a free people will often do. Hold on, I don't need a novel. What's the problem here? What do you want me to do? You guys trying to turn yourselves in for something? I want to talk to a lawyer! Yeah! Yeah, knock yourself out. This is DC. I'm sure you can find one around here. But look, the only law that I see broken is, is littering, and that's a little below my pay grade. As I said, we are the Boston Ape. And we have come here to Washington to talk about the war. So listen, mm -hmm. listen to us. Look, Father, Father, you know, I'm not going to debate the war with you. That's not my job. You know, but oh, you can appreciate my position, can't you? Look, if you want to turn yourselves in, go back to Boston. That's why we have local field offices. But if your heart is set on turning yourselves in, oh my God, there is a field office down near Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. 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 Now, have you guys had your physicals yet? I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Look, do me a favor. Clean up this mess before you go. was rushed to the floor and passed after a perfunctory debate by voice vote. The measure has already been approved by the House and now will go to Nixon for his signature. The measure paves the way for the selection of eligible 19-year-olds first, exposing each man to the draft for only up to one year. At present, a man may be exposed to the draft for as long as six years. Secretary of Defense Melvin R. Lard said that the Nixon administration would phase out and eliminate all student and occupational draft deferments. Laird said he also recommended to the White House, White House to phase out all deferments and that Nixon wanted to move in the direction that all young men would be treated equally and fairly. A fire destroyed draft records and furnishings at the Nicolette County Selective Service Office early on Tuesday, and the FBI later announced that it had arrested a 21-year-old on a federal warrant, charging him with destruction of government property and interference with the selective service system. Brian Wayne Wells of Mankato was arrested shortly after 9 p.m. on Monday and will be making an appearance today before a U.S. commissioner in Minneapolis. Large quantities of draft files were damaged or destroyed late Saturday night or early Sunday morning at the State Selective Service Office and at local offices in downtown St. Paul and Minneapolis. Officials say they have no suspects or leads at this time. The damage was so extensive that Colonel Robert P. Knight, director of the State Selective Service, says that it will be difficult to conduct inductions after March. March draft records have already been sent, he said. I mean, come on. All right, fellas, settle down. Uh, Peterson, can you uh, hand these out for us? Oh, Agent Johnson, so nice of you to join us. Please have a seat. Okay. Some of you may have already gotten a heads up about this. Now, Peterson has handed out the dossiers and your assignments for this afternoon's operation. In brief, we have received inside information that a series of coordinated attacks will take place against selective service offices tonight. Alexandria, Winona, and Little Falls. Now, each of you is going to be assigned to one of those three locations. You're going to go out this afternoon and team up with local law enforcement, either the police department or the sheriff's office. Now, fellas, fellas, eyes are on us. We need a win here. Sir, sir, is there a is there a reason to believe that there might be a bombing risk here? I know that's yeah, not the I mean, uh, MO of the protesters, but the has, things have been escalating, and the recent bombings, yep. 
What do we think about that? Look, I understand your concern on that point, but as you can see in the dossiers, it seems highly unlikely. However, we need to remain vigilant and consider every possibility. Yeah. Sir, this is a very thorough profile. Can we ask, uh, where did this intel come from? No, you may not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fellas. Right after lunch, let's get on the road. Let's get those SOBs. Yeah. support any course of action that is violent and destructive. We both know there are things that are wrong and things that need to be changed, but those things will not be changed by people who break into selective service offices and try to destroy records or, or break out the windows of courthouses. Those kinds of acts will set us back a decade or a generation. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. <laughs> I'm coming to you live from outside of the Hennepin County Courthouse located in Minneapolis where about 100 demonstrators are protesting the arrest of eight young men for the selective service break-ins last night around midnight in Winona, Little Falls, and Alexandria. They are all said to be from the Minneapolis area and most if not all are connected to the University of Minnesota. Those arrested, Francis Cronkey, Michael Terrio of Little Falls, Brad Benneke, Donald Olson, and Peter Simmons of Winona, William Tilton, Charles Turchek, and Clifton Ullin of Alexandria. We learned that there was a fourth break-in earlier today at a draft office in Wabasha. No one has been arrested in the, in the connection with that raid. However, the FBI apparently did not know of that one earlier. The eight are arrested for violating federal selective service laws and are being held on a $50,000 bond each. Associate Dean Watts from the Law School. Dr. Watts. Pleasure. Pleasure. Pleased to meet you. It's a pleasure. Uh, please, uh, please have a seat. Coffee. Anyone for coffee? No, thank you. No, thanks. Uh, well, thank you for coming down. Uh, we'll just get right into it. I'm assuming by now the two of you have seen this. Yesterday's edition of the Minneapolis Star Tribune featuring full profiles of all of the so-called Minnesota Eight. 
we understand the reporter uh, Ivans? Molly Ivans. Molly Ivans uh, was around campus, and the two of you may have spoken with her. I'm sorry, is this a disciplinary hearing? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. But I would like to know if either of you, in fact, spoke with her. So what if we did? Would that be a problem? Well, I'll be upfront about it. I did speak with her, but I was very clear that she was not to use my name in the article or any mention of my affiliation with the university. And she kept her word on that. Well, Maggie, yes, thank you for that. And no, Jim, no one's in trouble. <laughs> but we do need to tread lightly. So this isn't really about talking to reporters. Well, it is. Uh, reporters and us, to be frank. Charles Turchik, 23, Phi Beta Kappa, magna cum laude, graduate of the University of Minnesota. He enrolled in law school last fall because he dropped out after a few weeks because he said the work was so simple he was bored. <laughs> they took him back again this fall anyway when he reapplied. Peter Simmons, 19, would have been a junior at the University of Minnesota this fall, majoring in history and planning to go on to law school. Francis X. Cronkey, 25, is the program director at the Newman Center, University of Minnesota. Michael Terrio, majored in psychology at the University of Minnesota. Clifton Eulin was attending the University of Minnesota and is described as an outstanding student. He had dreamed of going to law school and becoming a people's lawyer. Donald H. Olson, 26, is a graduate of the University of Minnesota. <laughs> With an international relations major, he was president of Zeta Psi fraternity. William Tilton, 22, is a well-known figure on the University of Minnesota campus. He has been active in student government there since his freshman year. Do you see where I'm going with this? The university is all over this story, and this is not the sort of press we need. With all due respect, Dr. Fitzgerald, there are 37,000 students on this campus. Now, it only makes sense that some portion of the students, probably a high portion, are against the war. What do you want us to do? What do you think we're supposed to do? Deny that we know them? Seven out of the eight had direct connections to the University of Minnesota. And the eighth, uh, Brad Bedecky, I, I understand he has a sister enrolled here. <laughs> I know Brad Benneke's father, Arnold. He's a county attorney, and he and his wife are involved in local Republican politics. But I bet they're catching hell over this. But Brad <coughs> has always had a community interest. In fact, he volunteered at a Big Brothers camp, and he's been working recently with a psychiatric assistant with emotionally troubled teenagers. That's just it. We all know one or two of these kids, and the two of you know most, if not all of them. Am I right? Yes. Of course. I remember Terrio, he wouldn't pay $25 to get his diploma after he graduated. I know Michael, I met him at the Draft Information Center. Mike, he's a passionate young man. He truly believes what he's doing is saving people's lives. Heck, he used to be a junior seminarian. That Cliff Eulin is a friend of his. Eulin is really reflective. Not reactionary in the least. They aren't reactionary. Did you see what they wrote about the two of them? Terrio and Eulin joke that they learned to play cribbage in order to have something to do if they got caught and had to do something in jail. Of course, the guards wouldn't let them have a board. Here's the thing. They're all good kids as far as I can tell. They're not doing this out of maliciousness. Well, you mentioned Terrio being in the seminary. I've had long conversations with Frank Cronkey at the Newman Center about theology. Well, the guy teaches a course on it at St. Catherine's. He talks about fighting for the soul of the country, but not in a fanatical way. What I'm saying, what I've already said, is that we have to tread lightly. Let me be explicit. I know the two of you are active in the anti-war movement, and I make no judgment about what you do on your own time off campus. But if you break the law, if you cross a line, there may be severe repercussions. Is that a threat? No, it's an acknowledgment of the reality we face. Fuck. You are two of the best professors we have at the College of Liberal Arts. If, if anything, we asked you up here to help protect you. You can help yourselves and your students by flying under the radar. Look, look. Dr. Fitzgerald and I care about these young people, too. We both know Charles Turchin. 
You know, he spent a year working with Vista at a Job Corps camp working on housing issues, and we know his heart is in the Good right kid. place. As a matter of fact, I was partly responsible for getting him readmitted to law school after he dropped out last fall. Did you know he is a championship table tennis player? And don't let him hustle you. <laughs> when we all know Bill Tilton, he's been so active in student government. He, he's a good leader, he's charismatic, and he's got a cool head. It's true. I've seen him diffuse some pretty tense situations, both on campus and off. I, can I take you up on that coffee now? Yeah, yeah so would you like I'll, it. Oh, okay. I, I may be being dense here, but it doesn't seem to me that this is really about talking to the press, is it? Dr. Well, may I, Doctor? Uh, Donald Wilson has been working full-time radical for about three years now, working at the Draft Information Center, teaching at the Free University, and participating in several radical projects. Radical? Uh, and now, I know radical may not have been intended to be a pejorative, but I will guarantee you the majority of people reading this will consider that to be a very scary word. Now, contrast that with, uh, let's see, oh, Peter Simmons became politically active during the summer of 1968. He worked on community organizing projects during the summer of 1969 and turned in his draft card during the October moratorium at Washington, D.C. Combine that with the fact that he served on the Brooklyn Center Conservation Commission, and he doesn't sound so threatening. Now, I get the gist of what you're saying, but isn't this really just a matter of perception? Aren't people going to think what they want to think? Well, that may be true, but there are certain people who, how do I put this? Certain people whose opinions matter a great deal more than others, such as state legislators, to be blunt. You're concerned about funding. The University of Minnesota has developed a reputation, deserved or not, of being a haven. No, it's more than that, of being a breeding ground for radical ideology and anti-war extremism. Articles like this and some of the words used in it only further that perception. And when enough people, I don't know, and when enough taxpayers read this and contact their legislators, it's going to affect us all. This university is under intense scrutiny, and the pressure is building. But legislatures are, are signaling that we can expect significant cuts to our next funding request. Publicly, they say it's not political, but privately, this is a major concern. All we're asking is that the next time you talk with a reporter or you show up at a demonstration that could turn ugly, think about how those cuts may affect your students or yourselves. Agent Patty, uh, you were in Winona on the night of the break-in, were you not? Yes, that is correct. At what time on that evening did you arrive? I arrived about 3 p.m. on Friday. How many other agents did you have with you on that occasion? There were five agents, including myself, an additional number of local law enforcement officials in a support capacity. Okay, and, and then uh, when the defendants broke oh, into objection, the... objection, Your Honor. Sustained. Mr. Renner, I appreciate your expediency, but uh, try not to get ahead of yourself. I apologize, Your Honor. Okay, uh, Agent Patty, uh, at, at some point did you recognize that someone had entered into the office building? Well, myself and three other agents were waiting in a storage room. Where were the other law enforcement officers at that time? Uh, they were all outside in various locations. Uh, and continue? Well, we were in the storage room and we could hear glass breaking and the sound of metal pounding on metal. Uh, did you come right out at that time? No, we waited a little bit, and then we exited the storage room and confronted the three men. Were you at that time able to identify who those three men were? Yes, yes we were. We identified them as Simmons, Olson, and Beneke. Thank you very much, Agent. Your Honor, I have no further questions. Mr. Tilson, any questions for this witness? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Agent Patty, did you see these men actually vandalize or destroy anything? No, I was in the storage room. I heard the windows breaking and the crowbars prying open the yeah, fire but you didn't. But you didn't actually see any of that. 
No, they were smart enough to stop when we got out. Objection, Your Honor. These men were there in the middle of the night with crowbars and masks and gloves and spray paint. Pretty, pretty obvious they weren't there to register for the draft. Sustained. Uh, Mr. Chilson, any other questions? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Agent Patty, among the items in the office, did you notice any livestock? Pardon? Did you see any livestock destroyed in the office? No. How about munitions? No. Forage? Maybe some standing timber? Objection, Your Honor. This has nothing to do with this case. Your Honor. It's irrelevant. These are all items which are explicitly protected from sabotage by law. What is not on the list of items protected from sabotage by law are the files in this draft office. And for this reason, these charges should be dismissed immediately. Your Honor, the law also protects any item of you that can be useful to the government. And that certainly includes material for the national defense. Uh, draft files do not constitute national defense material. And even if they did, Mr. Renner here has failed to produce any evidence that these men destroyed any records. Sustained. Mr. Tilson. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Agent Patty. You may step down and take your seat. All eight defendants will be bound over to federal grand jury. The bail will be set at $50,000 oh, each. Your Honor, I would like to request that the defendants be released without bail. I mean, $50,000 is an undue burden, and none of these men represent a flight risk. Anything to add to that, Mr. Renner? Well, Your Honor, the government adamantly opposes the release of these men without bail. The court needn't be reminded that these men are part of a vast conspiracy across the nation. And we have not yet identified the perpetrators of the uh, raids on Wabashaw. Well, I am inclined to reduce the bail, but not eliminate it. Would the court consider reducing bail to, say, $1,000? Oh, Your Honor, $1,000 is far too little an amount to impair these men. Uh, the bail will be set at $10,000 each and uh, with a deposit of $1,000 per person. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Your Honor, would, would the court consider $15,000? Mr. Renner, I've made my mind up. So ruled. <laughs> to the editor, I feel the Tribune owes the public an explanation concerning an article on Monday morning entitled... References Matt made to Molly Ivan's, Ivan's lavish draft defense of the eight draft dodgers, whom she refers to as well, draft raid idealists. Through Molly Ivan's, the Tribune seems to gain sympathy for eight men who are accused On of July 13th, hats. you devoted several columns... Your to paper the had the story of those nuts who destroyed draft raids. Many people have seen it fit publicly to go to the aid of the eight charged with raids on draft paper, offices. Which fits much less gives much paid space to an article praising such people along in the same category as communist and underground Their acts are con condoned because of their high education? That is just poppycock. It says they could get five years and a $10,000 fine. Let's make sure they get every, every day and dollar of it. Actually, your newspaper is not the only ultra-left-wing characteristic I have found here in the Twin Cities. And take Hubert Humphrey and Gene McCartney. The eight persons don't mean any harm. They only want recognition. If these men are guilty of these acts of which they are accused, they are criminals. And After be reading as it, such. I was left with a distinct impression your newspaper felt these accused lawbreakers should be deified. Well, These the people the got their silly ideas from one Martin Luther King, who decided which laws he would obey. The first time he was jailed, he was let off or out. He should have been kept out of sight for a good many years. She aligns with anti-war activists who habitually praise Red China, Russia, and Castro, but relentlessly damn the United the States. The mood of this area is pacifist to the point of being unpatriotic at times. I would like to see them get the recognition that they deserve during the Aquatennial, a public hanging of all eight. Ken, New Hope, Minnesota. William, Fridley, Minnesota. Natalie, Delwood, Minnesota. Charles, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Avery, Pine River, Minnesota. David, St. Louis Park, Minnesota. An editorial from the Minneapolis Tribune. The raid 
wait on Minnesota draft offices last weekend may not do much to bring any closer an end to the Vietnam War. In fact, such destructive tactics seem instead to be feeding a conservative reaction. Conservative that reaction? Or that's the problem. Draw from the venture. I think they're just making it worse. The American strategy does more harm than good. What, what are, are they talking about? Reality places the participants in the ambiguous position of turning to the immoral violence. Stupid fakeheads think they can do what they want to do. What's immoral? At least they're not shooting at you. The young men are intensely idealistic. Type who before the Vietnam War might have been in the Peace Corps or, or in seminary. The Peace Corps. What does that tell you about instead of violence? They do anything to get out of serving their country. Violence to oppose violence, however, is that they lose much of the moral force of their position. That's probably true. That's the real crime. The nation. They break the law. Who would be listening to them? Why should we listen to what they have to say? Our best to return to the rule and style of reason. These kids can't see reason. The politicians are the ones with our without reason. Don't see how a return to the rule and style of reason is served by destructive illegal action based on any philosophy that the end justifies the means. Something's got to change. Something just has to change. Something needs to change. Something has got to change. To the, the editor. editor. The eight young men who were arrested and charged with sabotage of government property after the raids Saturday on four offices of the Selective Service System will, I suppose, be convicted and sentenced to prison terms. Much as they I have broken the law with the aims of the eight young men who tried to destroy draft board files. We can't have double standards of justice. We when must you argue that those who resort to violence to oppose violence lose much of the moral force of their position. For example, when the postal employees went on an illegal strike which cost millions of dollars of damage, they were punished when with a big raise and the promise of another such one. Such as those who write editorials going to realize that they have the power and responsibility it to is ironic that the letters concerning the Minnesota have done more to help to the cause of these men than harm them. But speaking for millions of other Americans who are in sympathy with those men, I would like to thank them for following their consciences, I refer for sheer courage the in the face of, of overwhelming odds. Regarding the draft it race. seems to me that you overlook an important distinction between people and property. It is not such raids that feed conservative reaction, but such editorial. We know that in a free society, men must follow the higher law of their consciences if that law conflicts with the statute books. Again, when you suggest that some of these protesters have been driven beyond the bounds of rationality, I am forced to ask, where do you when think the these bounds of rationality are? When the teachers went on an illegal strike, they were punished by having many of their, if not most of their demands, granted. Most of these letters were in favor of such good and just punishments as five years in jails and a public hanging. We must be just as severe with the Minnesota Eight. They should be punished by abolishing the draft and by getting our troops out of Vietnam. It seems to me at least conceivable that today, in the light of the violence heaped upon human life, when both the day here comes and in Vietnam, we will be able to say we have conquered these evil policies, we will look back at the lonely course chosen by the Minnesota Eight and realize that theirs was an important contribution to peace. That an act of sabotage designed to slow the butchery and the recruitment of young men for this national madness might not only be a highly rational act, but also a very patriotic act. To you who wrote those letters, you are radicalizing more and more adults, both young and old, with your opinions. Stephen, Minneapolis. Edward, Lake Elmo. Elvin, St. Paul, Minnesota. Elaine, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Ellen, Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm reporting to you live from the St. Paul Federal Courthouse. Earlier today, a federal grand jury issued indictments against eight young men who were arrested in raids in July in three draft offices. The men are now known as the Minnesota Eight, and they are charged with attempted interference with the selective service system. Arraignments will take place in early October. However, 
Because these charges involve three break-ins in disparate locations, it is possible the trials could be held separately in Duluth, Fergus Falls, and Winona, and could possibly be divided among as many as three different federal judges. Uh, counsel? All right, uh, Ms. Gilson, uh, are you prepared that your client should be arraigned at this time? Your Honor, I am. As you are aware, this is one of three connected indictments handed down by the same grand jury. And it is our feeling that all of these cases should be heard together before this court. Now, I believe the plea could be entered and all of the motions brought within 60 days. Well, the court set this time, Mr. Tilson, at your suggestion. I am of the view that since we are here, a plea ought to be entered, particularly since you told me you were going to move one of the other judges of this court for consolidation. I intend to, Your Honor. I intend to move the other judges of the court to refer the various matters uh, to you. Uh, as you know, the cases are currently venued in Duluth, Fergus Falls, and Winona. And it is my strong belief that all of the motions should be heard by one judge. Well, I believe that Judge Debit has been assigned the other two cases. Is that correct? I know he's been assigned to one of the cases. I'm, I'm not positive about the Fergus Falls case. Well, the 6th Division is frequently handled by Judge Debit. So, pending the issue of consolidation, I have no objection to giving you some time. Although, as I have said, I think a plea ought to be entered today for the matter at hand. Now, does the United States Attorney have any view on this? Well, Your Honor, the government agrees with you. We, have, we are here today for arraignments. It makes sense to go forward with the pleas today. I don't see how that would cause any prejudice to these defendants whatsoever. Moreover, having the pleas in, we would then be in a position to logically proceed with the motions without regard to what goes on in the arraignments before Judge Devin on Monday. Uh, that would be satisfactory. All right, counsel has suggested 60 days. Does that sound reasonable to you for motions, Mr. Renner? Well, Your Honor, we don't object to 60 days uh, if counsel feels he needs it for this case, but we are just talking now about this case only, and in no way does the government suggest that it is willing to concede to a consolidation of these cases. I am aware of that. Well, you are aware of that. I don't know whether I am or not. What? I don't know whether to be complimented or not that you're going to refer the other cases to me. I am not the chief judge, you know, and so that final determination is not up to me. <sighs> well, all right. It will be with the understanding that pleas will be entered at this time with 60 days for pretrial motion, and if it develops that you need more time because there's a problem of consolidation or lack thereof or some other issue, the court wouldn't be adverse to extending the time upon a showing of need. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Therefore, I will ask that the clerk now arraign the two defendants, Francis Xavier Cronkey and Michael Dwayne Terrio. Following last week's arraignment of two members of the Minnesota Eight, in which federal judge Philip Neville granted defense attorney Kenneth Tilson 60 days to prepare for trial, the remaining six members of the Minnesota Eight appeared today before federal judge Edward Devitt. However, Tilson, who was also representing these six, was given only one week to file pretrial motions by Judge Devitt. Meanwhile, we have just learned that one of the members of the Minnesota Eight has filed an affidavit of prejudice against Judge Devitt in hopes that he will be removed from the case. Gentlemen, in the subject concerning the affidavit of prejudice filed against me, myself, uh, by the defendant Benneke, I will hear arguments. Mr. Tilson. Thank you, Your Honor. As the court is well aware, in April of this year, Your Honor presided over the trial of uh, Brian Wells, who was charged in connection with the St. Peter draft office break-ins. My client, Brad K. Benneke, was in attendance at that trial as a, as a spectator, and upon Your Honor's entrance, he, uh, well, he refused to stand. Your Honor ordered him ejected from the court, at which time my client called Your Honor, and I quote, a, a pompous ass. <laughs> Your Honor cited him for contempt, for which he was jailed 10 days and fined $100. Well, I vividly recall the occurrence, sir. Your Honor, I mean, given this prior encounter, 
we would argue that it would be impossible for your honor to be totally impartial with regard to Beneke's current case uh, before uh, your honor. Uh, in order that justice be meted out, uncolored by any personal, judicial, or political prejudice, we request that your honor disqualify himself. Now, as you know, Judge Neville is currently hearing two of the related defendants' cases, not connected to this court, but he is willing to hear all eight. And we feel that would be a satisfactory solution. Uh, Mr. Renner. Oh, Your Honor, the government uh, feels that this incident described by counsel does not come close to the standard for requiring disqualification of the court. That was purely a judicial matter. It was not personal or political in any manner, shape, or form. The government has great confidence in the ability of this court to be fair and impartial with all defendants. As, a matter of, as to the matter of consolidation, Your Honor, the government does not see any need for that. Uh, in fact, all that would do would be to delay the justice for all these defendants, and the government is opposed to consolidation. Very well, counsel. I will expect briefing from both sides by tonight. In Federal District Court in Minneapolis today. In U.S. District Court St. Paul today. In Federal Court today, three. Two. Three. Of the so-called Minnesota, 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 Minnesota Federal charges. Of, Judge, of federal charges of interfering with the Selective Service System. Judge Edward Devitt Hurd, please. From the defendant. Francis Xavier Cronkey. How do you plead to this indictment, sir? Under the tradition that I come from, as a Catholic lay theologian, I have to reflect upon the way Jesus responded when questioned by Pontius Pilate. <laughs> With that in mind, the only appropriate answer I can offer is the same one that Jesus gave to the political authorities. You say so, not I. All right, sir. <laughs> if you wish to stand mute, the court will enter a plea of not guilty on your behalf, if that helps you any. I think it's a procedure that I will do that. Michael Dwayne Terrio. How do you plead to the indictment, sir? Not guilty. Clifton Eulen. How do you plead, sir? Not guilty. Charles Larry Turchik. How do you plead to this indictment, Mr. Turchik? To make a plea is to assume the role of a defendant, to play the game instead of relating to each other as human beings. It's impossible to conceive that I could receive mercy from a court that jails people for refusing to kill. The court will enter a plea of not guilty with respect to the defendant, Turchik. William Leo Tilton. How do you plead, sir? Not guilty. Fred K. Benny. How do you plead to this indictment? I cannot answer it. I do not know whether the act is I'm accused of is legal or illegal, moral or immoral. But I do believe with every fiber of my being is that war is immoral. The court orders that a plea of not guilty be entered with respect to Mr. Benneke. Peter Allen Simmons. How do you plead, sir? I refuse to enter a plea. The defendant Simmons stands mute like the others. A not guilty plea will be ordered into the record on his behalf. Donald Henry Olson. How do you plead, sir? I refuse to enter a plea to the charges I am guilty of no crime. Ultimately, not guilty pleas were entered on behalf of all eight of the defendants. Meanwhile, Judge Devitt also denied a motion today to disqualify himself for previously sending one of the defendants to jail and fining him for calling him a pompous ass at a trial in his court earlier. On the matter of the briefs and affidavits we filed regarding the proposed disqualification of me, the counsel, a judge may only disqualify himself if the alleged bias is personal. There was not a personal thing about this. I have no personal uh, relationship with Defendant Beneke. This is strictly a judicial matter. The motion is denied. Attorneys have said they will appeal the ruling. 
In a surprising moment of accommodation, the usually strict Judge Devitt granted the defense an additional two weeks to file pre-motion trials. Originally given, Judge Neville, who try, who's trying the case for the other two of the eight, had already granted the defense an extra 60 days for their motions, meaning three trials, now confirmed to be separate, will span for months. Plans for a march and rally in support of the Minnesota Eight were made Wednesday evening by about 60 people meeting in Kaufman Union at the University of Minnesota. The march is set for November 2nd, the day of the first trial of the Minnesota Eight. At a hearing today, Judge Edward J. Devitt was ruling on a motion before the court ahead of the trial date when about 20 spectators were ejected from the federal courtroom for refusing to rise when Judge Devitt entered. The spectators were anti-draft sympathizers. The U.S. Marshal and federal agents had to drag the young protesters from the room when they refused the order to leave, shouting fascists and pigs. None were arrested, and most of the motions were denied. The trial of the first group of the Minnesota Eight was tentatively set for Fergus Falls. However, attorneys for the defendants made a motion to Judge Edward Devitt of St. Paul to have the trials moved to St. Paul for the convenience of the defendants and the attorneys involved. Although previously represented by Judge, I'm sorry, although previously represented by attorney Kenneth Tilson, who is also representing Turchek, defendant William Tilton asked the court for permission to represent himself at his trial. I know I am going to prison for five years, Tilton stated when asking permission of the court to represent himself at trial. If I am going to prison anyway, let me go defending myself. Let me go as a human being. Meanwhile, attorney Michael J. Galvin Jr., who was representing Eulen, was denied in his request for a separate trial. And finally, Brad Beneke is going to be represented by his father, Arnold Beneke, a former McLeod County prosecuting attorney, and by his brother, Captain Bruce Beneke, an attorney serving in the United States Army. Three of the Minnesota Eight will be tried in St. Paul instead of Fergus Falls. District Court Edward J. Devitt ordered the change of venue for William Tilton, Clifton Eulen, and Charles L. Turchik, all of the Twin Cities. The trial is scheduled for 2 p.m. Monday. I am reporting to you from downtown St. Paul, where a crowd of demonstrators has gathered outside the courthouse on this first day of the first trial of the Minnesota Eight. The trial of three of the accused, William Tilton, Charles Turchick, and Clifton Eulen turned into a trial for two as Clifton Eulen's attorney sent him a letter saying that he had changed his plea to guilty, surprising the other defendants and the defense attorney, Kenneth Tilson. Your Honor, we have a mostly empty courtroom here while numerous individuals with an intense interest in this trial are out on the street. Many have been waiting outside in the cold and the rain for hours. They've been quiet. They've been peaceful. I, I can't see any reason why this trial can't continue in public. Counsel, can't you see we have over 80 prospective jurors out there. They need a place to sit. After jury selection is completed tomorrow, I will consider letting a limited number come into the courtroom, but only a limited number. Anything else, sir? Yes, Your Honor. As long as we're on that subject, I would like to state, for the record, that I feel that the voir dire process was sped through, and I don't believe sufficient time was granted to interview these jurors. So noted. Mr. Renner. Well, Your Honor, the government is well satisfied with the process which was followed, and we are well, well satisfied with the jury which has been selected. Very well, counsel. Uh, before we recess today, I have a few basic instructions for the members of the jury. You may not discuss this case with anyone, not your spouse, not your friends, not your mother, 
and surely not with any of the other jurors until you begin the deliberation process. Do you understand? We are in recess. Day two of the first of the Minnesota 8 trial erupted into a heated exchanges today when the defense counsel cross-examined FBI agent Donald <coughs> Peterson. Special Agent Peterson, who was the FBI informant with regard to these raids? Objection, Your Honor, that's irrelevant. The crime occurred, that is all that matters. The identity of the informant is quite irrelevant to this case. Sustained, oh, sir. Your Honor. I said sustain, Mr. Tilson. Special Agent Peterson, amongst the individuals that you apprehended the night of the raid was one Clifton Ulan, who has since changed his plea to guilty. Is this correct? Yes, that is correct. It was Clifton you and the government Objection, informant? Objection, Your Honor. That's irrelevant. Your Honor. Sustain. It is essential that we know who the FBI informant was, Your Honor, if we are to have any hope of maintaining a current attorney-client privilege. And we have moved to receive this information <coughs> on numerous occasions for that very reason. I said sustain, Mr. Tilson. You're starting to try my patience. Special Agent Peterson. Did the FBI use electronic surveillance oh, to get an intel on the accused? You do not need to answer that, Agent Peterson. It's all right, Your Honor. The, the answer is no. The FBI did not use electronic surveillance in this case or any of the related cases. The FBI does not engage in illegal wiretapping. <laughs> Following a lunch recess, after again being pressed to allow the public into the courtroom, the judge allowed a small group of about 15 individuals to enter. Okay, everybody, no pushing. You can go in and you move out of the way. Okay, two more, that's it. Move out of the way so the people can get through. One, people! Not today, you're not! I have to get in there. Sorry, ma'am. We're full. My son is in there. Uh, who's your son? William Tilton. He's one of the defendants. One of the eight? Okay. <laughs> you can go in. No more. That's it. That's it. The first of the Minnesota 8 trial injured its third day today with a slightly larger gallery of spectators in attendance. Mrs. Bjarke, can you please tell the uh, jury what occupation you are in? Yes, I am the clerk for the Douglas County Draft Board. And is the city of Alexandria, Minnesota, within the jurisdiction of your draft board? Yes, it is located in Alexandria. On July 10th, what time did you leave your office? Oh, uh, about 5 o'clock p.m. But before leaving, did you notice an agent Peterson and perhaps other law enforcement agents present at the office? I knew there were FBI there, but but I didn't know what they were what it was about. And now, Mrs. Berkey, I'd like you to tell the jury what you observed when you returned to your office the following morning. It was a terrible mess. Oh, it, there were FBI and police everywhere. I keep a very tidy desk. And the night before, I was clear before I left. But by morning, my drawers were open, the papers were strewn everywhere, and my typewriter was broken. Broken how, Mrs. Bjerke? Two keys were broken. And which two keys were those, Mrs. Bjerke? The one and the A. <laughs> How many active files do you have in your office? Uh, about 5,500. How many new cases do you get each month? 30 or so. From your perspective, Mrs. Bjorki, how did this break-in and this vandalism that occurred on July 10 affect the operation of your draft board? It was a terrible mess. It, it really, it, it held us up with all the cleanup and everything. No more questions, Your Honor? Your witness, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Mrs. Berkey, how many files were destroyed in your office as a result of this break-in? It was an awful mess. 
yes, I, I understand, but how many files were actually destroyed? None. Uh, how many active files did you tell Mr. Renner are currently housed there? Ma'am? 5,500. And uh, how about the inactive files? I'm not sure. But certainly more than 5,500. Yes, quite a few more. And were any of those destroyed? No. So, we have 5,500 active files, an indeterminate number of inactive files, and all of them intact. Correct. Yes. <laughs> Mrs. Berkey, how many registrants from your county have been killed or wounded in Vietnam? I object, Your Honor, that's irrelevant. Sustained. Mr. Tilson, the war in Vietnam is not relevant to this case. Your, Your Honor, I would beg to argue that. You may attempt to argue all you want, sir, but the objection is still sustained. Mrs. Berkey, how many registrants from your county have refused induction? Objection, same objection, Your Honor. Your Honor, Mr. Renner here has been allowed to ask questions about the number of active files, how many new cases are brought into the office each month, numbers. This is along the same lines of questioning. Mr. Tilson. You are delving into questions about the war itself. The war in Vietnam is not relevant to this case. Your Honor, nothing could be more relevant. The objection is sustained. As the trial entered the fourth day, William Tilton, representing himself, tried to show a political motivation for the arrests as their warrants stated that they were known anti-war activists and opponents of the draft. Defense attorney Kenneth Tilson shocked the courtroom today after an intense, intense exchange with the judge. Your Honor, every time I ask any question, whether pertinent to this case, if it also relates to the war, I am shut down. Can I expect this to continue? As I said before, Mr. Tilson, the war in Vietnam is not relevant to this case. How many times do I have to tell you that? Any evidence or testimony with respect to the war is inadmissible. Your Honor, I, I have 17 more witnesses to call. That ruling, that ruling prevents their testimony. You may be correct, sir, sir but my ruling still stands. then defense rests. After closing arguments, Judge Devitt offered instructions to the jury. Men and women of the jury, you have a very limited responsibility in this case. You have no philosophical, no religious, no theological responsibility at all. Your only job is to find on the facts whether the defendants are guilty or not guilty as charged. If the war is wrong or the selective service uh, system is unfair, that remedy is not found here. It is found in the halls of Congress and with the executive branch. Now, a good motive is not an excuse for these charges. If you find them guilty, then deeply felt and high motives will not negate or excuse their guilt. The war, and I repeat, the war is not on trial here. You must re disregard any and all evidence or testimony that is related to the war. After deliberating for less than an hour, the jury returned a verdict of guilty. guilty. Guilty for both Charles Turchick and William Tilton. I am reporting to you again from downtown St. Paul, where trial number two of the Minnesota Eight is underway. Just 12 days ago, a jury found William Tilton and Charles Turchick guilty on charges of attempted interference with the Selective Service. 
defense attorney Kenneth Tilson and Brad Benneke's attorneys, his father and his brother, made a number of motions, all of which Judge Debbitt denied. Among them, several motions for the government to reveal the name of their informant on the case of Judge Debbitt to disqualify himself for the case due to prejudice and to dismiss charges because, quote, the Selective Service Law is unconstitutional. Your Honor, all other motions aside, I, I would like to request that the court consider relaxing some of the more stringent security measures in place here. None of these defendants are considered dangerous, but I can't help but feel that the atmosphere being engendered by the obviously large number of marshals present is beginning to affect the jurors' attitude toward these defendants and the risk that they actually pose to public safety. Your Honor, these are the most serious and challenging of times. As the court knows, there are people out here who are willing to engage in violence in their effort to change public policy on the war. Now, I commend the defendants in this case. They behaved admirably. But trials of this nature do attract many protesters uh, to the court from itself, and not all of them are peaceful. The court is aware, aware not everyone is, that just last night, a bomb threat was made against this very building. Your Honor, in light of all these facts, the, court, the government feels that the, um, the uh, restrictions placed upon the, the court upon security are well warranted. And later that afternoon, after the lunch recess, Everyone, please rise and exit the courtroom in an orderly fashion. But this is not a drill. We are evacuating the building. Another bomb threat was called in. A sweep of the building determined that the threat was not valid, and the trial resumed later that same afternoon. Mr. Tilson, you had something you wished to say. Yes, Your Honor. Given the current atmosphere, I mean, two bomb threats within 24 hours? I can't see how this court can possibly protect the safety of these boys, much less any of us. And I find it highly irregular that the defense was not notified of this earlier bomb threat until court today? I move for a continuance, Your Honor, until all American troops have been returned home from Vietnam. Maybe that will provide a calmer, more reasonable atmosphere and a safer one in which to hold this trial. Motion denied. The second day of the trial is underway. And after the unbelievable events of yesterday, which included bomb threats, today is sure to be uneventful by comparison. Well, it's ridiculous. And I think the whole thing is a waste of taxpayer money. Well, everyone knows those radicals are guilty. Absolutely. Well, you know what? Even they know they're guilty. They're proud of what they do. They should count their lucky stars that they're in this country. Would you think they get a fair trial in Russia Not a chance. or in no. Vietnam? No. They have no idea how lucky they have it here in the U.S. of A. Exactly right. Really, what are they contributing to society? They're just a drain. All that education, and what are they doing with it? No. No. My daughter is a student at Hamlin University. Oh, well, that's, that's just wonderful. Yeah. But her friends are not that soft. Of course they're not. No. Honestly, honestly, I want to go over there with a pair of scissors <gasps> and cut off that spring blue hair. Now, 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 this is a free country. But it looks terrible. It's a free country. Honestly, time to go. Day two of the Minnesota trial in St. Paul took an unexpected turn today. Your Honor, something has been brought to my attention that uh, I believe must be presented to the court. Um, during the recent lunch break in the cafeteria, several members of the jury were heard discussing the case. 
Overheard by whom, Mr. Tilson? By members of Defendant Benneke's family, Your Honor, his mother. And I have talked to others who have corroborated this. I have a list of the things discussed and, um, and the jurors involved. I'll take that note, sir. Counsel, come forward here. Counsel, have you seen this? I have not, Your Honor. Jimmy. Wow. All right. Keep the jurors outside. I'm going to call these people in one at a time. Mrs. Blanche Burkhardt. Blanche Burkhardt? This way, ma'am. Please take a seat in the witness stand, Ms. Burkhardt. Right here? Yes, right there. Ms. Burkhardt, now I want you to answer truthfully to what the questions I'm asking you. Absolutely, Your Honor. Now, Mrs. Burkhardt, did you, while at lunch, discuss any aspect of this case with other members of the jury? <gasps> oh, no, Your Honor. Now, did you discuss the case with anyone at lunch or at any time during the last couple of days? Absolutely not. Are you sure? I think I'd remember. Yes, I'm sure. You may leave by the door over there to the jury room. Julia Prozinski. Julia Prozinski? Yes, Sit there, Ms. Prozinski. Right there. Ms. Prozinski, have you had any conversation with anybody about this case at lunch or elsewhere? Um. No, sir, Your Honor, I wouldn't dream of it. Not with family members or roommates? I live alone. No, sir, Your Honor. How about members, other members of the jury? No, sir, Your Honor. Thank you. That's all. Thank you may you. exit. Thank you. Mrs. Jean Goltz is next, sir. Jean Goltz. Sit right there, Ms. Goltz. Mrs. Goltz, did you have a nice lunch? Yes, I did, thank you. Now, I understand that you were chatting at lunch with some other members of the jury. Can you tell me what you spoke about? Nothing really of significance. I remarked how nice everyone is here. The marshals and the bailiffs and the, the staff, well, everyone. It's all so orderly. Anything else? Oh, I mentioned that my daughter was a student at, at Hamlin University. Did you talk about anything that was relevant to this particular case? Um, well, of, of, cor of course not. I mean, I mean, no, 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 I didn't. Thank you, Mrs. Goltz. You may exit to the left over there. Mrs. Virginia Carletta. Virginia Carletta. Sit right there, Mrs. Carter. Isn't that for the witnesses? No, today it's for you. Today I get to sit there? You get to sit there, yes. Wow, that's kind of exciting, isn't it? Yeah, well, please be seated. I have a couple of questions, Mrs. Carletta. Can you tell us what sort of things you discussed today at lunch with your fellow jurors? I'm not sure. It was probably the food. You discussed the food? Uh-huh. Uh, we discussed, well, we discussed the ham sandwich, well, actually it was a ham and cheese sandwich, and it was from the cafeteria. Now, the bread was a little dry, but you know, that's not your fault. Okay, just, uh, you spoke about nothing else. Well, I, I feel a little silly saying this, but I just feel such a swell of patriotism, of civic duty. Being up here, you know? Well, you know, I probably said something like that at lunch. Well, anyway, so it's so wonderful being where we have a system where everyone has a fair shot at justice, not like Russia. Is that all? Yep, that's all. Thank you. You may go back to the jury room over there. Okay. The last juror. That's all. Yes, please leave. Uh, the last juror, uh, Mrs. Uh, Jean Buckingham. Mrs. Jean Buckingham. That's not necessary, <laughs> Mrs. Buckingham. Now, please be seated. 
Yes. Please be seated. Now, Mrs. Buckingham, at lunch today, while talking with the other members of the jury, do you recall anything, anything at all, being said about this case? This trial? Yes, at lunch today. Anything that was said to by anybody about this case? Well, let me think. Um, well, well, I did try to warn them. I told them they shouldn't talk about such things. But you know how women are. We talk, talk, talk. But I, I did warn them, Your Honor. And what sort of things did the ladies talk, talk, talk about? Either well, with yourself or anybody else. Well, I wasn't a part of any of it. But there was some talk about radicals and long hair. And now, remember, Your Honor, it, I was not a part of this. But someone made a comment that it was a waste of taxpayer money, I believe. Now, Mrs. Buckingham, I have a very important question that I'm going to ask you, and I want you to answer it truthfully. Did those conversations affect your partiality in any way? Well, to answer truthfully, uh, I don't know. You, you may be excused, Mrs. Buckingham. Counsel, please come to the bench. Well, counselors, based on that, it seems prudent that we should declare a mistrial. Do you have any comments? Agreed, Your Honor. I'm afraid so, Your Honor. Thank you, counsel. Judge Debit declared a mistrial this afternoon in the case of Brad Benneke, Donald Olson, Peter Simmons. Because of the Thanksgiving holiday next week, the new trial is set for to begin on Monday, November 30th. Your Honor, especially in light of the events of two weeks ago, we need further reassurances that the jury selected is going to be impartial. Counsel, may I remind you, this is federal court. You're not in state court. I asked each juror if they could be fair and impartial, and if they were biased against people with beards or long hair, that, I believe, is sufficient. Uh, respectfully, Your Honor, I disagree. All of the questions were basic, yes or no, asked in front of all the prospective jurors. Your Honor, once again, I, I beg the court to allow us to question the veneermen ourselves. We are going to need a much more extensive voir dire, or we are going to run into the exact same issues as before. Mr. Tilson, I've already considered that request and have already denied it. The process took an hour. That's twice as long as the last trial. Surely that's sufficient. Defense attorney Kenneth Tilson told reporters that the judge, quote, did a worse job than before. The first witnesses were also called today. Only four days into the new trial, testimony was concluded today. A jury of eight men and four women deliberated for less than two hours before returning a verdict of guilty. Guilty. Guilty, guilty for all three defendants. Brad Benneke, Donald Olson, and Peter Simmons. The trial of the final two Minnesota Eight is underway today in Minneapolis after Judge Philip Neville granted the request to change the location from Duluth. An extensive jury selection process resulted in a jury of seven women and five men. The examination of potential jurors was a marked difference from earlier trials, at which defense counsel expressed dismay over the rushed selection. In opening statements today, Kenneth Tilson, who's representing Michael Terriot, and Francis Cronkey, who's representing himself, took a notably different approach to the defense than the other members of the Minnesota Eight. 
They are not denying they entered the Little Falls office destroying and removing draft records, but argue this was done to prevent a greater crime, that of the Vietnam War. Much of the Cronkies' defense also seemed to rest on his Roman Catholic faith, arguing this was a religious act. Judge Philip Neville allowed testimony today for the defense by two Vietnam veterans. The two men are members of Veterans for Peace and outlined in great detail actions they took in Vietnam under direct orders, which they now believe to be wrong. Despite constant objections from the defense, Judge Neville only halted the testimony occasionally when defense attorney Kenneth Tilson pushed for more gruesome details. Dr. Daniel Ellsberg, now you have held several high-ranking positions within the executive branch as something akin to a, a policy advisor, is that correct? Uh, substantively, yes. And could you tell us, Doctor, what the most recent position is that you've held within our federal government? Well, most recently a confidential consultant to uh, presidential advisor Henry Kissinger. And uh, in that uh, position, Doctor, could you tell us, do you ever advise on domestic matters as well as foreign policy? Well, yes, uh, domestic matters as they related to foreign policy. And how about matters around anti-war protests or other forms of civil disobedience? Objection, Your Honor. Those things would have no relevance to this trial. This is not a case about foreign policy. Uh, Your Honor, this does go directly to our defense. Your Honor, the defense of crime of necessity <clears throat> has no application in this case. It is, under the facts, it is not available to these defendants. Well, counsel, I've made no decision on the legitimacy of the defense strategy. But for right now, I'm inclined to let that line of questioning continue. Just keep in mind what we talked about earlier, counsel. Don't go beyond the limits of the testimony we've set. Objection is overruled. Dr. Ellsberg, the question was about anti-war protests and the like. Yes, we did discuss those matters. And could you please, doctor, give us an example? Well, incidents such as are happening in Minnesota and acts of civil disobedience are very much a consideration when determining policy, very explicitly so. A former Secretary of Defense Clark Clifford's decision not to send 206,000 more troops in 1968 was a direct result of fears that domestic unrest, specifically draft resistance, would be overwhelming. Dr. Ellsberg's testimony was permitted, despite numerous objections from the prosecution. The defense also questioned Professor Arthur Westing, a professor of biology of Wyndham College in Putney, Vermont, who directed a study of the ecological effects of the war for the American Academy for the Advancement of Science. The study concluded that a quarter of a million acres of mangrove forest had been destroyed, along with several million acres of hardwood forest in the interior, and 125,000 tons of milled rice. Men and women of the jury, you've heard broad-ranging testimony in the last week. You've sat through many hours, not only about the events in Little Falls, Minnesota, but U.S. foreign policy, first-hand accounts of the horrors of war, and testimony regarding religion and faith, and on the so-called defense of necessity. My instructions to you now as you go out to deliberate are simple. You are to disregard all evidence about the war or about the defendant's ethical or religious motivations. The defense of necessity or justification is only applicable in emergency situations. As such, it is quite limited and well outside the scope of this case. I have my own views on the Vietnam War, as may you all. Those views have no place in your deliberation or in the verdict that you return. Following instruction from Judge Neville, the jury deliberated for in excess of two hours, returning once for clarification of the instructions. Several of the women on the jury were in tears as the verdicts were read. Guilty. Brad Benneke, Donald Olson, and Peter Simmons. Clifton Eulen, 
the only one of the Minnesota eight defendants to plead guilty received no jail time. Brad Beneke and Peter Simmons were deemed youthful offenders and were given indeterminate sentences of treatment and supervision under the Youth Corrections Act. Frank Crocky, Michael Terrio, Don Olson, Bill Tilton, and Chuck Turchett all received the maximum five-year prison term and were released less than two years later on July 23, 1973. The following is an editorial from the Minneapolis Tribune. They chose Fort Snelling National Cemetery for their protest. They believed it symbolized the death and destruction of the war in the Southeast Asia. These were the Minnesota Eight, some of whom were preparing to go to prison for five years for their role in the invasion of draft offices to challenge the war. Despite the snow and the cold, there was a warmth and camaraderie among the Eight and their friends as they exchanged greetings, embraces, and light comments. Some of the mothers were there, looking so proud of their sons, but blinking back tears of empathy. One of the eight read a statement deploring the expansion of the war through use of bombings and mercenaries. A tall man dressed as death was symbolically buried. A dog barked to punch away the protesters' chant, and songs of solidarity rang through the air. Opinion is sharply divided over the Minnesota Eight and their acts of defiance. To some, they are radical revolutionaries who received exactly what they deserved for breaking the law and attempting to destroy public property. To others, they were true patriots acting out of conscience to protest an insane and immoral war. And for still some, they used the wrong methods to make the right point. History may treat the Minnesota Eight more approvingly than do their contemporaries if the war in retrospect comes to be viewed even more negatively, and if such protest comes to be seen as courageous acts of conscience. Opinion surveys that show overwhelming aversion to the war already vindicate the purpose of their protest, though not their methods. Whatever is thought of the acts of the Minnesota Eight, and such methods must be condemned as long as there are legal alternatives. The eight can be admired for their deeply felt conviction against the war and the decision of five of them this week to enter prison as a demonstration of the sincerity of those convictions rather than go underground or flee to Canada. We didn't act out of foolishness, said one of the eight. We acted out of emotion and frustration, but we acted for a cause. An outsider at the National Cemetery ceremony couldn't help but grasp the arm of one of the eight and say, good luck. And then, the youth was off to prison. <laughs>